As most of you know, this is Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes looking very grateful after the Apollo 13 incident and their rescue. And recently, high-resolution photographs were released of their training and less pleasant moments such as this famous incident where they had to jury-rig a CO2 filter racing for their lives. And moments like this, suffering in the cold of space. But in spite of all that, they brought back some magnificent data and beautiful photographs, doing their duty as every astronaut does, the best of us all. And this is Jim Lovell when I met him in the 90s, during the time when he was promoting his book and, of course, the movie Apollo 13. And I asked him if he knew my Uncle George, who still worked at the Cape at the time, and was delighted when he said that he did remember him. But what few people ask is, what would have happened if we had lost these men? After all, the space program was in decline, and if these men had died, would it have been canceled? Very probably. And if so, what would we have lost? Welcome to yet another episode of The Angry Astronaut. Another day, another opportunity to get pissed. And what am I pissed about this time? Well, we just commemorated the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13 mission and all the excitement and drama that surrounded it. But what we never seem to cover in any of the information that uh, we put forth and videos, documentaries, or anything about the Apollo program is what came after 13. Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17. I mean, could you list off the names of all the astronauts that participated in those missions off the top of your head? I couldn't, not even at this very moment after researching it. And that really pisses me off because some very, very important scientific information was gathered by those people, and every one of those missions was unique and invaluable to the future of manned spaceflight and our understanding of the universe. Let me explain. The best way to proceed, I think, is just to start with 14 and move up. And what few people realize is that from the moment of the Saturn V launch, the Apollo 14 mission very nearly ended the entire thing. And we'll learn a little bit from this stock footage. The mission was supposed to go to Fra Mauro, the largest crater on the lunar surface, which is where 13 was supposed to go. But from the very beginning, there were problems. The command module, for example, could not link up with the landing module in orbit. They tried one time, twice, three times, four times, with help from mission control, frustration building, and no success. A fifth time was attempted, Again, no success. Finally, a duplicate of the probe being used to dock was brought out as they tried to figure it out, and then finally, on the sixth attempt, they succeeded. But the problems continued. First, there was a fault support that would not correct itself from the LEM that had to be corrected for mission control at the last second, otherwise the whole mission would have been a failure. And then the landing radar malfunctioned. They couldn't tell how far they were from the surface. 
and that had to be corrected at the last moment. If any of these issues had not been fixed, the mission would have been a failure at least, and possibly fatal. Once again, with Apollo 14, the entire project nearly came to an end. But again, NASA came through, and Commander Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell got to work on the surface while Stuart Rusa did his work in orbit. An important work it was, gathering some of the oldest samples in the entire Apollo mission using old school maps with out of date orbital information and a pull cart that was called a Met. No dune buggies for these guys. But the work was worth it because NASA scientists gambled correctly that the Fra Mora area contained the most ancient geological samples that could be found simply because Fra Mora was such a massive crater and the ejecta would come from deep within the moon and be very very old as a result older than anything we had found on earth and thus tell us more about the history of the solar system but the most dramatic moment of the mission came later on. And this was when the two astronauts tried to ascend Cone Crater, a thousand feet high, something no rover could possibly do, traveling through geologic time as they went, driving themselves to the edge of their endurance, their air and water running out in the process. But they were determined to get to the top and gather as much information they could in the process. These men simply knew no fear. Or if they did, they sure didn't show it. Traversing more and more difficult terrain as they went, and with every new rim, another rim beyond it. There seemed to be no end to these mountains created by meteoroids rather than plate tectonics or volcanism. And then finally, after a Herculean effort, Mission Control and the astronauts decided they had gone far enough. And how tragic it was, because they were compelled to stop within 150 feet of their objective. And they wouldn't find this out until a week later. What a huge disappointment it must have been although the samples they gathered were invaluable. In all, they collected 45 kilograms of lunar samples, including a 9 kilogram rock called Big Bertha. And some of these were over 4 billion years old, older by far than any sample on Earth. Samples that had been untouched by plate tectonics, or volcanoes, or anything else, waiting all that time for us to find them. What a magnificent triumph, and it is hardly talked about. And none of it would have happened had Apollo 13 ended in failure. And yet they still weren't done. You see, Apollo 12 had left behind seismometers, and so did 14, and the plan was to crash the LEM into the lunar surface after they achieved orbit, which they did to perfection. And the resulting vibrations were picked up by the seismometers, give us, giving us information about lunar composition, its core, and other information which is used to this day. And yet this was only the beginning, because my favorite Apollo mission, Apollo 15, contained, among other things, one of the most profound statements ever made about man's space travel, every bit as significant as one small step for a man. Have a listen. Fundamental truth to our nature. 
man must explore. And this is exploration at, at its greatest. And explore they did, using a lunar buggy that allowed them to travel further afield than ever before. The reason I like this mission more than any other is because Scott and Irwin interacted with each other like little children. They were so enthusiastic. In fact, at one point, while Scott was rambling on about the beauty of the moon, Alan Shepard, grumpily back at Mission Control, said, To hell with that shit. Give us details of the burn. And speaking of Shepard, first man in space, you may have noticed that I didn't mention his golf club stunt in Apollo 14, where he used his four iron or something to hit a golf ball a million miles, because that's what Apollo 14 became known for as opposed to all their achievements. And many achievements were made in 15 as well as 14 that have been simply forgotten. And speaking of achievements, Scott and Irwin were bubbling over with enthusiasm when they discovered this rock, which later became known as the Genesis Rock. It's believed to be part of the early lunar crust and we had no idea that we would find a sample that old. They also took their core samples with equal enthusiasm and then got in their buggy and went to the foothills of the Apennine Mountains, 15,000 feet tall, formed by meteoroid impacts, as I said before, instead of the processes that we're familiar with here on Earth. Such an utterly alien world which we would have known so much less about if 13 had failed and Apollo had been canceled. And by the way, as far as Warden was concerned, well, he wasn't satisfied to just wait for them to return. None of the guys who stayed in orbit did. Instead, they took photographs and measurements and made incredible discoveries of their own. Warden, for example, found cinder cones dotting the lunar landscape, proving decisively that there had been extensive volcanic activity in the ancient lunar past, as scientists had been debating over for some time, now proven by the guy in orbit. And yet they still weren't done. They launched a sub-satellite, the first to be launched by a manned spacecraft which took readings of the magnetic field, gravitics, and a lot of other information. Just think for a moment as we look forward to how much man has yet to discover and remember how much we have already discovered because of the efforts of people like Scott, Warden, and Irwin. And we're still not done. But now it was time to put the lunar rover through its paces. In Apollo 16, John Young, Ken Mattingly, and Charles Duke landed in the Descartes Highlands. Well, Young and Duke did. Mattingly stayed in orbit. For the reason that... There was a lot of evidence that there was extensive volcanic activity in the past, which had yet to be thoroughly studied. But they traveled and traveled and found no evidence of lava. But they found some very, very large rocks, including the most massive boulder ever discovered on the moon. Not this one but we'll see it in a moment, called House Rock. And as they approached it, the bigger it got, until they began to doubt just how far away it was and whether they could even reach it, but it was the height of a four-story building and contained no geologic records of volcanism. But this did not make the mission a failure. The rover allowed them to travel further afield than any mission before them, 
and they went to places such as the Cinco Craters, which were the, the highest elevation that any lunar mission had accomplished to that point. And they marveled at the magnificent landscape that was only accessible because of the rover and only accessible because people were there and not robots. But for those scientists looking for evidence of lunar volcanoes, they had to wait until the next mission and the last, Apollo 17, crewed by Gene Cernan, Ronald Evans, and Harrison Schmidt. And sadly, all of them knew that this was to be the last. And so they looked back on the Earth, knowing that their mission to the moon might be the last ever. But that didn't stop these astronauts from getting to work. And this mission was unique because it included a geologist, Dr. Harrison Schmidt, who was a bit inexperienced when it came to spacesuits and flirted with near disaster while trying to take a core sample. Had he cracked his helmet on a rock at that moment, it would have been disaster. And yet, back on Earth, people were hardly taking notice. Instead, they were talking about something new, something called the Space Shuttle, something that would replace the Apollo Project and all of our dreams to expand further into the solar system and instead remain in low Earth orbit. But work continued on the moon in spite of that. Cernan and Schmidt found what they were looking for, orange dust which turned out to be tiny volcanic beads, proving that there was volcanic activity on the moon, as scientists had anticipated. And yet, back on Earth, people were talking about new projects while these two astronauts continued their work, not knowing that their work was about to stop for half a century. Cernan and Schmidt pushed the rover to its limits, to the point of what was called safe return, where if the rover broke down, they would have just barely enough air and water to return. And by the way, those little captions you're seeing are various representatives of NASA and other scientists talking about the bright and beautiful future of manned exploration, whereas really what they were talking about is the end of manned spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit. But Cernan and his scientific companion took samples from a wide variety of locations gravimetric measurements, explosive packages to continue the study of the moon's composition, the longest duration EVA in history, and then they planted a camera at long length so that they would be able to film themselves taking off, leaving the moon behind for the last time. But before they left, Gene expressed his parting thoughts. I'm on the surface, and as I take man's last step from the surface, back home for some time to come, but we believe not too long into the future, I'd like to just say what I believe history will record, that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow, and, as we leave the moon at Taurus Litro, we leave as we came, and God willing as we shall return, with peace and hope for all mankind. Godspeed, the crew of Apollo 17. Now all of that as lengthy as it was by YouTube standards, was the briefest of glossing over of all of the achievements of those missions. I encourage you to look into each and every one of them in greater detail, because 
there was just entirely too much for me to cover in one episode, or ten episodes, to be honest. And we do a huge injustice to those people's accomplishments by not learning every bit as much about them as we've learned about Jim Lovell or Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, or any of the other names that we can more easily bring to mind. But the other injustice is even worse because those people went to the moon believing that they were pioneers, the first to begin a long history of manned exploration. And instead, they were betrayed. Betrayed by politicians who didn't appreciate what they were trying to achieve at all. Who instead looked upon what they were doing as a competition with the Soviet Union, and that was pretty much it. It's unforgivable, half a century later, and we still haven't gone back. And frankly, after researching all of this, I don't care if we go back with the Starship or the SLS or whatever. I mean, I prefer the Starship, but I don't care what method we use. We need to go back in this time to stay. We need to do justice to the Apollo program and return to the moon and go on to Mars and even greater objectives throughout the solar system. We owe it to these people and everything that they accomplished. So, until we're back on the moon, and finally getting back on track, I encourage all of you to stay angry about space.